But we're starting uh, again in our series on Acts, and we're going to be going Acts chapter 14 today. And as usually with uh, the way I kind of approach it is, is sometimes a little bit off the wall because I just see different things than probably the normal people do. But it's all right. We'll get through this together. So we're going to start in verse 1. Actually, we're going to start in verse 1a. So we'll make it through the first half verse anyway. And I'm going to be reading through the NIV. Uh, and again, the re only reason I use the NIV is because it's small and it's easy to carry. All my study Bibles, I have to bring the pickup truck to carry them around. So I prefer, uh, not necessarily my, my favorite version, but it's, it's adequate. All right, so verse 1. It says, At Iconium, Paul and Barnabas went as usual into the Jewish synagogue. So this was their pattern, okay? So every time they'd go to a town, if there was, if there was a Jewish synagogue there, and any time there were 10 Jewish males in, in a city, they were supposed to have a synagogue. They would go in first to the synagogue. Uh, and there's a couple, couple different reasons for that. On the practical level, it just makes sense that they would go because the Jewish person would have a background, obviously, in the Old Testament. They would be uh, ex expecting a Messiah, while the Gentiles did no squat. So you were starting from a baseline of nothing. So on a practical level, it makes sense why they would go to the Jewish synagogue first and begin and give their message, because again, they were expecting a Messiah. But there's other reasons also why. And this has to go back. I want to read a couple. And as usual, we're going to be moving around quite a bit, so get ready to flip through your Bibles. But the first one I want to look at is Romans chapter 1, verse 16. So Romans 1, verse 16. And Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. Now, in Acts chapter 3, I'm going to give you a couple different ones. We're talking first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. Acts chapter 3, this is Peter, and verse 24 through 26. Peter's giving a message. He's giving a message to the, uh, to the Jewish people. He's in Jerusalem. And he says, Indeed, all the prophets from Samuel on, as many have spoken, have foretold these days. And you are heirs of the prophets and of the covenants God made with your fathers. So he said to Abraham, Through your offspring, all peoples on earth, will be blessed. When God raised up his servant, he sent him first to you to bless you by turning each of you from your wicked ways. And another one, Gospel of Matthew. I just want you to keep seeing this theme. Matthew chapter 15 and verse 24 And this is actually, it's when the, the uh, Canaanite woman is coming to Jesus and to get her daughter healed, who has a demon. And Jesus answered her, and it says, he answered her, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. Which at the same time sounded a little cruel, but he had a purpose in that. But Matthew 10 Matthew 10, verses 5 through 8. This is Jesus speaking. 
and he's gathering the, the 12 disciples. They're getting ready to go out on their first uh, missionary trip. And these 12, Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. As you preach this message, the kingdom of heaven is near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely as you have received, freely give. But gave specific instructions. Do not go among the Gentiles or even the Samaritans. Okay? So you have to hold that intention because, as you remember, Jesus, the new covenant has yet to be uh, put into, in, has, has actually not started yet. So he's still under the times of the old covenant. And so there's going to be a period of time between the old covenant, the new covenant starts, and after centuries of Jewish people being under the Old Covenant, you don't just turn that ship around in a hurry, which is why uh, next week when they do, Nathan will be doing uh, Acts chapter 15, the council in Jerusalem, why that was such a, a big deal. So as you think about that, <clears throat> we have to hold in tension because like in Galatians, obviously, it says that there's neither Jew nor Gentile, there's neither male nor female, but we are all one in Christ Jesus, okay? So there's a tension there of going between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant and how long it took that to really take hold amongst the people. Even though in the spirit it was done quickly, it took a while for it to really take hold amongst the people. Now, I want to read a couple. There's another tension that also happens in, in Romans chapter 2. I want to read a, a couple of verses here. Verses, Romans chapter 2 and verses 28 and 29. Paul says, A man is not a Jew if, if, he, if he is only one outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a man is a Jew if he is one inwardly, and circumcision is circumcision of the heart by the Spirit, not by the written code. So he says, a man is not a Jew, he is only one outward. In, in other words, he's saying, it's not about ethnicity, it's not about your, your bloodline, okay? Now also in, it says similar thing in, in chapter 9 of Romans, and verses 6 through 8, He says, it is not as though God's word has failed, for not all who are descended from Israel are Israel, nor because they are his descendants are they all Abraham's children. And he goes on and says, it is not the natural children who are God's children, but it is the children of the promise who are regarded as Abraham's offspring. So this kind of puts a little tension, if you think about it. So he's obviously saying that just because someone is ethnically a Jewish person or Israelite, that does not mean he is a true Israelite. So what you have, you have this spectrum, and on one, and it's usually as true with so many tensions in the Bible, you know, there's a road, and there's a ditch on both sides. Now, on the one hand, people would use these verses and talk 
and, and uh, would basically use it to justify um, replacement theology, which says the Lord is through with the Jewish people, and he only works through the church. And even in, uh, in some of them, that they, there's no future for Israel. But then you go to chapter 11, and actually 10 and 11 of Romans, and it's very clear as he talks about the branches being broken off and they're going to be put back in, that he's talking about ethnic Israel. So on one extreme, you have the replacement theology. On the other extreme, you would have people who think, like we have the Israel flag in here, that, and we need to bless them, but that Israel can do nothing wrong, and every decision they make is right. And I think that's a, also a mistake on the other extreme. In fact, if you spend very much time in Israel, you will find out that the ultra-Orthodox are not necessarily your friends. They will persecute Christians, and they persecute Christian ministries there. So there's this balance between the both. So it's not replacement theology. It's not that, and, and there are some Christian ministers who even believe that Jews will be saved still under the Old Covenant. And obviously, we believe that's wrong because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through the Son. So you have this, this tension sometimes that goes on in, with different truths in the Word of God. So that was one reason, or, or a couple different reasons why. First, they went to the, to the Jewish synagogue first. First, because it's just practical. It makes sense. To, to go to a people who already have some type of base, a background. And then the other part about being how the gospel is clearly first for the Jew and then for the Gentile. Now, the second half, of, we'll call this verse 1b. And it says, Now there they spoke so effectively that a great number of Jews and Gentiles believed. Now, the only version I saw where it says they spoke so effectively was this NIV. The ESV says they spoke in such a way. Uh, the NAS, New American Standard, says in such a manner. Because when I read that, and I read it as that they spoke so effectively, then that makes me think, okay, were there times where Paul did not speak effectively? So does that mean it was the word was based on his ability? How he did a good job sometimes and not such a God sometimes? And so I really don't like the way that NIV interpreted that. But because when you look at what Paul says about himself, he says, you know, in Corinthians, it says, I did not come with persuasive words, but I came in the power of the Holy Spirit. And then he even quotes some others who say of him, well, his, his letters are strong and weighty, but his speech is of no account. So in other words, in reality, Paul was not necessarily a great communicator. He's a great writer, but not necessarily a great speaker. But it, that wasn't what was important. It was the power that was on the word, and it was the word that was doing the work. So again, I just, I don't like that interpretation of, you know, speaking so effectively. All right, verse 2. But the Jews who refused to believe stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their mind against the brothers. So immediately there's an opposition. So it says the Jews stirred up the Gentiles and they poisoned their mind. Now think about this. They, they all heard the same message. There is the message of the gospel. 
And there's two responses. One response is they receive it gladly. Their life was changed. And another response is not just, you know, well, whatever. It's, it's almost a violent uh, coming against that word. In fact, where they want to try to poison the Gentiles who received the word. And so you've got the same word, and, and it's creating two different responses. And it's interesting, I, I've, I've, you know, in the whole argument between Arminianism and, and uh, predestination and Calvinism and Reformed theology, you will get people on both sides of that argument kind of use that verse. In other words, I know uh, a guy who, who, is, who I really respect, his, who comes from a Reformed Calvinistic background, and he would use this same thing, saying, well, when I got saved, me and my best friend, my best friend was a better guy than I was, went to the service, the message touched me, my life got changed radically, and my best friend did not. So he equated that with, well, God sovereignly chose me. But then on the same hand, somebody else could argue on the other side of that argument, no, no, it was because of that, that person's choice. So it's just an interesting when you, you figure the different tensions and different ways people come up with their theology. So anyway, they all heard the same message, and the Jews stirred up the Gentiles, or tried to stir up the Gentiles. Verse 3 says, But the Jews who refused to believe stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their mind against the brothers. Now, ESV just says the unbelieving Jews. So that puts a little different context in it. But verse, verse 3, So Paul and Barnabas spent considerable time there, speaking boldly for the Lord who confirmed the message of his grace by enabling them to do miraculous signs and wonders. I think that's probably one area that we fall pretty short in is signs and wonders. And not only us, but I think probably generally in the church at this time. But I think the Lord is going to be releasing more and more of that, more healings. But at the same time that I say that, I was um, listening to... uh, an interview with uh, Mike Winger. I don't know if you guys have heard him. He's a guy who was a pastor. Now he just full time on the air. He has a, a call in questions and he'll answer questions. You know, people have concerning the Bible. Uh, and I actually came uh, actually first heard of him when I was doing some research, and he did a whole series, like a four hour series on the Hebrew Roots Movement. And so I saw an interview with him just recently, and he was talking about uh, Benny Hinn. And he's done a whole, I think, a four-hour or four uh, hour session. And he just takes a lot of, of the clips from Benny Hinn. And so that brought to my mind some things, because I saw it in that that I've seen in some other ministries. Sometimes what happens, like in Benny Hill, uh, Hens ministry, people get saved, some people get healed. But when, you, when that happens, you draw people. People come. But what I have seen throughout the years is that in order to keep the machine running, in order to keep people coming in, in order to keep the money flowing in, It begins to be compromised. They begin to call out healings where the person really wasn't healed, or they begin to prophesy, manipulate through prophecy to obtain a goal of using the people for their their purposes. And we always have to remember that God will not share his glory with anyone. And so even as we begin to move in that, we have to be very careful 
that what happens is truly documented, it's truth, and we don't try to hype up or give some hamburger helper to what God's doing. But that happens because people have to keep the machine rolling, have to keep the people coming, have to keep the money. So just a, a word of caution in that. But we do desire to see the signs and the wonders. Okay, verse 4. Now the people of the city were divided. Some sided with the Jews and others with the apostle. So now we're talking about the whole city. The whole city is getting one side or the other side of this issue. Okay? Which made me think of back in Luke chapter 12, what Jesus said. Luke chapter 12. And verses 51 through 53. He says, Do you think I came to bring peace on earth? No, I tell you, but division. From now on, there will be five in one family divided against each other. Three against two, and two against three. They will be divided, father against son, son against father, mother against daughter, and daughter against mother, and mother-in-law against daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against the mother-in-law. So it says, you, you think I came to bring peace on earth? No, I tell you, but to bring division. And even sometimes, even within a family. So here you have a city, the word is preached, people accept it, people do not accept it. But it's interesting that the people who do not accept it, it's not just a matter of, you know, whatever, it's not for me, it's, no, it's a, it's a violent uh, coming against what was spoken. And so the Lord comes to bring division. And in this case, the whole city was divided. Okay, let's look at verses 5 through 7. It says, There was a plot afoot among the Gentiles and the Jews, together with their leaders, to mistreat them and stone them. But they found out about it, and they fled to the Lyconian city of Lystra and Derbe and to the surrounding country, where they continue to preach the good news. So there's a violent response, and Paul and Barnabas get out of Dodge, basically. So you have to know when to stay. You have to know when to go. You have to be led by the Holy Spirit. Because I think of Jesus, you know, the gospel says there were times when he was not willing to walk in Judea because of the Jews. So it's not a, because we could easily come and say, well, just stay there. Stay there and continue to preach the word. Well, the Holy Spirit's not telling you to do that. Your life might be cut a little short. So we really have to listen to the Holy Spirit in each situation to what the Holy Spirit is saying. So we'll look at verses 8 through 10. And it says, In Lystra, Lystra there was a man crippled in his feet, who was lame from birth. He had never walked. He listened to Paul as he was speaking, and Paul looked directly at him, and he saw that he had faith to be healed, and calling out, said, stand up on your feet. At that, the man jumped up and began 
to walk. So the first thing, this, this was really a creative miracle because the guy had never walked. So there's no muscle, there's no tendons. Those have to be created. It wasn't like just a healing in that sense, but really a creative miracle that happened. Now my question is to you, where it says, seeing that he had faith to be healed. So it wasn't Paul's faith, but he saw that the man had faith. Was that a word of knowledge he had? Was there something visible he saw that he knew that this guy had faith to be healed? Because let me give you an example on just the opposite situation of someone getting healed who was also crippled from birth. And that is in Acts chapter 3. Turn back a few pages to Acts chapter 3. In verses 8 and 9. And this is where Peter and John are walking into the uh, temple. We'll just start at verse 1, chapter 3. It says, One day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at 3 in the afternoon. Now a man crippled from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful where he was put every day to beg from those who were going into the temple court. Now, when he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Now, Peter looked straight at him, as did John. And then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave him his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver or gold? I do not have, but what I have, I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Walk. Taking him by his right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with him into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God, and when all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened. Now, in this case, this guy had no faith. He was just looking for silver and gold. He was looking for, he begged. That's what he, what he did every day to support himself. So this, this guy had no faith at all, but it was, it was Peter's faith in this case. Now, the worst thing we can do is we're praying for someone for healing, and it doesn't happen. We never say to that person, well, you just don't have enough faith, because that will kill their spirit. If your faith is not enough to get them healed, but don't be telling anybody else that they just need more faith. So two different styles of healing. Both had the same situation. Both were a creative miracle because they had never walked. But two different approaches. Okay, 11 through 13. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they shouted in the Lakotian language, the gods have come down to us in human form. Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul they called Hermes, because he was the chief speaker. The priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought bulls and wreaths to the city gates because he and the crowd 
wanted to offer sacrifices through to them. So these are the Greek pathions. Uh, the Romans would be a little different. It was, you know, instead of Zeus, it'd be Jupiter. Different gods, same name, or different names, same gods. Verse 14 to 16. But when the apostle Barnabas and Paul heard of this, they tore their clothes and rushed out into the crowd, saying, Men, why are you doing this? We too are only men, humans like you. We are bringing you good news, telling you to turn from these worthless things to the living God who made heaven and earth and sea and everything in them. In the past, he had let all nations go their own way. So they're making it very clear. No, we are not gods. We are just men. But I want to focus on verse 16. It says, in the past, he let all nations go their way. Now, that goes back to the, the Second Temple Jewish person's understanding of Deuteronomy 32, verses 8 and 9. So I'm going to turn there. Deuteronomy chapter 32. And this is part of the Song of Moses, where he's recounting the history of Israel. And he says, when the Most High gave the nations their inheritance, when he divided all mankind, which is Genesis 11, that was the uh, Tower of Babel, when he divided all mankind, he set up boundaries for the people according to the number of the sons of God. For the Lord's portion is his people, Jacob, his allotted inheritance. And again, in verse 8, if your Bible says, which the NIV did say, according to the number of Israel, that's a wrong translation. It should be according to the number of the sons of God. So he chooses Israel of all of these nations, one of the weakest nations. You know, he starts with Abraham. He builds a nation. He takes them of his own. The other nations, he let go their own way. And so from an Israelite perspective, this was clear. That's why until the new covenant to realize that, hey, it's not only Israel. The Great Commission says all nations, all people, all languages are now included in the commonwealth of Israel. Now, the EAS has that, and, and several of the versions have it right, where they say, according to the number of the sons of God. So they're let go their own way. Now, in verse 17 through 19, and he says, yet he has not left himself without a testimony. He has shown kindness by giving you rain from the heavens and crops in their season. He provided you with plenty of food and fills your heart with joy. Even with these words, they had difficult keeping the crowd from sacrificing to them. Then some Jews came from Antioch and Iconium and won the crowd over. They stoned Paul, and they dragged him outside the city, thinking he was dead. So this reminds me of, so here's this crowd about ready to worship Paul and Barnabas as gods. Here's the same crowd 
about ready to stone them. It reminds me of Jesus as he walks in on the day of Palm Sunday, and the crowd is yelling and screaming, and they're worshiping and saying, Hosanna, blessed is the name of the one who comes in the name of the Lord. That same crowd, less than a week later, was yelling, crucify him, crucify him. So how a mob mentality can turn so quickly. So in verse 19, again, where Paul says, but after the disciples had gathered around him, okay, after they stoned him, thought they killed him, he gathered, the disciples gathered around him, he got up, went back into the city, and the next day he and Barnabas left for Derby. Now, There's quite a few scholars who believe what happened here was what Paul's referring to in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, or 2 Corinthians chapter 12. I'm going to turn over there real quick. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Not all, but many do, of the scholars do. The second Corinthians chapter twelve. And we'll look at verses one through seven. And just about all the scholars uh, agree that he's talking obviously about himself in this. But he says, If I must go on boasting, although there is nothing to be gained, I will go on to visions and revelations from the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up into the third heavens. Now, whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, but God knows, was caught up to paradise. He heard inexpressible things that man is not permitted to tell. I will boast about a man like that, but I will not boast about myself except about my weaknesses. So he's referring back to a time where he was actually, whether in the body or out of the body, he doesn't know, he was taken into the third heavens, he was taken into heaven. And it says he saw things and experienced things that were inexpressible and things that he was not even allowed to share. So many scholars believe that this happened and that actually Paul did die, but he was resurrected. Because they're trying to figure the date, so they believe it's around AD 44. Other scholars would say, no, they believe it happened uh, back in Acts chapter 22, and I'll turn over there real quick. Acts chapter 22 and verse 17 through 21. Now this, uh, in this chapter, Paul is referring back to early in his ministry. In fact, this is right after uh, he had to escape Damascus after he got saved. Okay, and then uh, after he went to the wilderness, then he went to Jerusalem for the first time. So we pick up that story in, uh, in verse 17. And he says, When I returned to Jerusalem and was praying at the temple, I fell into a trance and saw the Lord speaking. Quick, he said to me, leave Jerusalem immediately because they will not accept your testimony about me. Lord, I replied, these men know that I went from one synagogue to another to imprison and beat those who believe in you. And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, 
I stood there giving my approval and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. Then the Lord said to me, Go, I will send you far away to the Gentiles. So some scholars are divided between which instance, and it may not be either one of them. It could be a whole separate thing. But they did try to connect that, especially in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, that he as he that he actually died, he was risen, and it was during that time that he experienced a trip to heaven. All right, verse 21 and 22. So again, as I said previously, they the next day he and Barnabas left for Derby. Okay, they preached the good news in that city, and they won a large number of disciples. Then they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the disciples and encouraged them to remain true to the faith. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God, they said. So Paul and Barnabas must go back to the churches that they've already established you know, strengthening and encourage them, see how they're doing. Now, it would have been a lot shorter trip if they just, going back to Antioch, if they would have just, especially because they're traveling on foot, gone straight back. But it was important for them to go back and check on the churches, again, see how they're doing, to encourage them. And in verse 23, it says, And Paul and Barnabas appointed elders... For them in each church, and with prayer and fasting, committed them to the Lord in whom they had put their trust. So they appoint elders in every church. They set up a, a church government structure. And then it says with prayer and fasting. So we have this combination of prayer and fasting. Uh, we have prayer meetings right now, just second Wednesday of each month. Unfortunately, we only had seven people there last night. So if we want to really see change, we need to be engaged in prayer. And it's important. So the next one will be the second June, second week, second Wednesday of June, between seven and eight, just an hour. And remember, Jesus said, can't you wait? Can't you tarry with me for one hour? So it's important that we support that. So they appoint elders in every church, set up a structure. And it says, after going through Pisidia and through Pamphylia, and when they had preached the word in Perga, they went down to Attilia. From Attilia, they sailed back to Antioch, where they had been committed to the grace of God for the work they have now committed. On arriving there, they gathered the church together and reported all that God had done through them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles, and they stayed there a long time with the disciples. So they returned to Antioch. This is the Antioch. There's two Antioch. There's one in, in what president of Turkey, but this is back in Syria, the original mother church that sent them out and supported them. And so they go back and basically they're giving a, a report of, of what has happened and the miracles that have happened and how, the, and probably the most important thing was how God had opened the door to salvation for the Gentiles. And we're beginning to see a major change in the church, from the church being primarily Jewish to now turning to its primarily Gentiles. And so that does create some issues, as you will see uh, next week. It's try to be dealt with in, in chapter 15, the Council of Jerusalem. But even after that, it was still going on. They were still having issues with the Judaizers, uh, and so it took time. You don't, again, you don't go from 
the old covenant for centuries and just step into the new covenant and everything's you know, completely new because your heritage, all you know, is back in the old covenant. But that's how, as we look at, again, this kind of pattern of how they went, they set up churches, they set up leadership, prayer and fasting was a major part of it. Also, during that time, there were signs and wonders, you know, signs are to make you wonder, signs are to make you get your attention. And so that's why they are important, but at the same time, they just must be done correctly and never manipulated or used in a wrong way or even the prophetic word, words to be used in a way that is really trying to manipulate people. So we just we learn as we go through the book of Acts and we see how the church grew, starts from intimacy all the way to where we are today. All right, so we're going to have a time of uh, prayer, opening the uh, altar up here for prayer. And I know we're going to have uh, June come up, and I'd like the elders to come up because you like to have prayer. And anybody else who would like to receive prayer, we're going to have some worship music in the background. And if you need prayer for anything, feel free to, uh, to come up for that. So, Lord, we just thank you again for your word. Lord, it is rich. We thank you for the examples that we have throughout Scripture, Lord. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you are faithful. We thank you, Lord, that you are patient, that you are kind, that, Lord, despite the, um, the failures we may have and the misunderstandings that happen, Lord, that you are, you are constantly drawing your people to a deeper walk in you, Lord. And so, Lord, we just ask today, Lord, that you would continue to mold us and shape us into the image of Jesus. Lord, that you'd grant us grace to be holy as you are holy. Lord, that you renew our minds by the washing of your word. Lord, that we would stay on the path of life and not get in a ditch in either the left or the right ditch on either side of that road. Lord, show us, give us your wisdom and direction. Lord, and we just continue to pray and cry out for more. More love, more power, more of you. Asking, Lord, for that increase of your anointing, an increase of the gifts of the Spirit, an increase of your authority. Lord, that we might minister to others in the power of the Holy Spirit supernaturally. Lord, we love you. We desire more. Lord, we want you to be our magnificent obsession. Lord, we ask that you would deal not only with the sin in our life, but Lord, the encumbrances, those things that keep us from entering into all that you have for us, Lord. Touch us, Lord. Increase. We love your presence, Lord. We welcome you, Holy Spirit. Lord, do what only you can do. We want to be pliable. We want to be moldable. Lord, we want to grow into your image. So, Lord, again, we thank you for your word. And, Lord, we ask that your Holy Spirit would now begin to circulate in this room, touching hearts, Lord. We ask, Lord, that you would begin to speak to different ones in here, Lord that you would share your heart with them, that if there's someone there to pray for, Lord, if they have a word of knowledge for someone, Lord, that you would give that. Lord, we love you. Lord, we love your presence. And Lord, we need all your gifts. We need that gift of faith and the working of miracles. We need those gifts of healing, words of knowledge, words of wisdom, that gift of prophecy, that gift of discernment, tongues and interpretation. Lord, the flow. We need every gift in our tool belt, Lord. 
So, Lord, we again ask for that increase. Increase in us, Lord. That we would be as John the Baptist who said, He must increase and I must decrease. So again, Lord, more of you. And we thank you again for your word. We thank you for your blessings, your faithfulness to us, Lord. Though every man be a liar, Lord, you are faithful. And we thank you in Jesus' name.